Okay, freshmen, good morning. Today is Tuesday, May 26th. I hope you guys enjoyed your Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I know the weather was nice. Hopefully you're able to get outside while still being safe. Um, we do have a special guest in our classroom today. This is my daughter, Quinn. Quinn, do you wanna say hello? You wanna say hi? She will be joining us for lecture. Um, anyways, uh, I do want to um, kind of go through what the end of the year is going to look like for you guys, uh, mostly so you can start planning your uh, your time and also just so you know that, you know, we're not going to have anything uh, crazy to catch you off guard. It's going to be manageable to end the year here in biology. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what our last few weeks will look like. I'll assign the final project. Um, the final project will um, basically go in as a final exam. It won't be worth as many points. It'll go into the project category. Um, we'll wrap up our um, content for evolution. And then lastly, that last page of that packet we've been working on, um, we'll finish that today and you guys can uh, upload that entire packet to Edmodo. Um, so. Let's go ahead and get started with um, what. So we'll take a look ahead at what our next um, few weeks will look like. Um, uh, starting Thursday, um, Thursday we will have a um, study guide to get ready for our quiz. And then our normal 3 p.m. Thursday uh, weekly meeting, which is so well attended. Wow, last week I think we had, was it seven, 70 students, 80 students? Let me... Oh, seven. Sorry, we had seven students last week. That's right. So anyways, um, this week for our weekly uh, gathering, we'll do a Kahoot uh, to help you prepare for your evolution quiz. That quiz will come on Tuesday, June 1st. So that is a week from today. Um, next Thursday, um, you'll have time just to work on your evolution projects. I'll be there at three o'clock just to answer questions. So I don't really have any, you know, content or anything like specific it's just if you're um you know lost on the project or or want to check something on the project you can always email me um but it might just be just as easy to sign in uh, you know at some point that afternoon um and then lastly your final project is due the following week um the week of uh finals so if you have me uh in the morning your project is due june 9th if you have me in the afternoon your project is due on the 11th so now looking at so looking now at our final project, um, as I mentioned, this is due, um, turned in either on the 9th or the 11th, depending on when I have you. Um, but it's it's pretty straightforward if you follow the, um, the instruction sheet. Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna um, choose an animal or a, a plant or a species of bacteria um, or fungus, any organism, any living thing, and you're going to um, Talk about how its its body, its form and function is evolved um, and adapted to the current environment that it lives in. Um, and then on the back of the instruction sheet, there is a, a list of environmental changes, um, random changes. Just, you know, if you think about the Earth's history, there's been periods of ice ages. There's been meteors that have hit the Earth and blocked out the sun and changed the weather. Um, there's been all sorts of these random environmental events that all of a sudden change the the um, evolution pressures or the environmental pressures. Um, think about it. If, if all of a sudden the North Pole is really, really warm, all those adaptations that a polar bear has um, are no longer adaptations. So anyways, you're going to then um, look at how your organism may evolve based on a set of environmental changes. Um, my, my biggest uh, piece of information is to stick to the outline format. So I clearly in the paper give you five sections that you need to complete. So when you turn this in, the first thing I should see are those five sections numbered and labeled and outlined um, clearly. This should not just be one big long paragraph, just like how a lab report is very specifically divided up into um, different sections and with different headers. Um, this should be done the same way. Um, so the um, project is, is attached to this post. Um, again, it's, it's five sections. The first two are based on the current um, environment and the current form of the organism that you choose. 
Um, and then the last three sections are based on hypothetical environmental changes and what the evolution of that species may look like. Um, so it really, it gives you a chance to be creative. Um, you can uh, show off your artistic skills. Um, and again, to get a good grade on this, just make sure you're following, sticking with that um, outline format. All right, so um, now it's time to uh, wrap up our evolution content. So go ahead and get out your um, journals. We can title this um, Three Outcomes of Evolution. So, you know, we've talked about the mechanisms of evolution. We've talked about the causes of microevolution. Remember that microevolution can lead to macroevolution, the formation of new species. But anyways, this is the three outcomes um, looked at on a very, say, like linear scale or two-dimensional scale. Um, Based on environmental pressures, natural selection can affect phenotypes uh, within a population in three main ways. Remember, phenotypes are going to be the traits, the, what you actually look like. Um, and these three graphs, I think, do a really good job of explaining it. So if you just look at the, um, you know, remember you halt a graph. So look at the, uh, there's no header, but there are axis labels. The x-axis is phenotype of shell color. This is for a hypothetical uh, snail. And then the y-axis shows the number of individuals. And the three types or the three outcomes here are stabilizing, directional, and diversifying. And if you look up top, I'll circle it for you guys, at this original population, the original population is known as um, a bell curve, which is pretty common in biology to have. Think about the average heights of humans. The average heights of humans would probably be shaped that's a bad drawing but like a bell curve um there are some humans that are really really short there are some humans that are really really tall but for the most part most humans are somewhere in this medium range um and so we see with the shell color of this hypothetical population they come in all colors um light medium dark and based on different um natural selection pressures three things could happen so the first one is stabilizing selection. This is when the environment favors intermediate variance, meaning it's not good to be um, dark, it's not good to be light, it's good to be medium. Um, now remember, I'm talking about color of shells um, as a easy hypothetical, but this can be true for um, uh, size of a creature's teeth or um, length of a neck or how fast you're able to run there for any trait um if the intermediate trait is best um so let's say we're talking about human ear size if small ears means you can't hear very well and you're not going to be able to stay safe from predators and you're going to die and large ears means um uh through sexual selection you can't find a uh, suitable mate um that would be stabilizing selection, meaning medium ears would be the best way to survive. Um, anyways, this often occurs in stable environments. Um, a great example of this, uh, another example would be human baby size. So think about this for a second. Why are um, brand new babies, why is it good to be medium size? Why is it bad for a baby to be really, really small? Why is it bad for a baby to be really, really large? So take a second just to think about that. Too small, baby can't survive. Too large, um, either the mother could die or the baby could die during childbirth. Um, another example would be peacock feathers. Take a second and think, why would peacock tail feathers be beneficial to be medium? Meaning the, the variation of peacock tail feathers gets pushed towards the middle, stabilized. Okay, uh, too large. And, oops, sorry, I went to the wrong slide. Uh, back to the, te the peacocks. Too large and um, they're easily caught by a predator, such as a tiger. Peacocks live naturally in India and East Asia. Too small and they cannot um, attract a mate because female pea hens often pick a mate based on the biggest tail feathers. So for peacocks to be successful, they want to have like kind of that medium size um, tail feathers. Okay, number two directional selection. This is when there's a shift, 
either to the left or to the right, meaning um, for whatever reason, it's not good to be medium shell color. It's good to be lighter or it's good to be darker, one or the other. Um, so this is when one of the phenotypic extreme is better than the others. Um, often this is due to something like a migration um, or gene flow, as we call it in evolution, um, some sort of environmental change. Um, an example here, insects ex exposed to insecticides. Um, some insects have tolerance to insecticides when you spray a field with insecticide. Obviously, the insects that have the most tolerance are going to be the ones that are favored. And so you're going to see the natural insecticide resistance of that population shift towards the extreme. Um, there's a video that I want you guys to watch about rock pocket mice. It's really interesting. Um, but a great example would be pretend that these are um, the different colors of mice in a desert environment. And with the light sand, the mice that are these colors survive. And the mice that are these colors, they don't blend into the sand, so they don't survive. Um, but then the environment changes. As you guys know, environments change. A volcano erupts, the ground gets covered in um, volcanic magma, it turns into dark colored um, volcanic rock, and then all of a sudden the darker color mice are the ones that can blend in and stay safe from predators. The light colored mice stick out like a sore thumb so hawks and eagles uh, and snakes and predators see them. And so you would see directional selection towards the um, darker color mice. And again, there's a video uh, that I, the video I want to show you guys uh, will be posted as well. Okay, and then last but not least, disruptive selection, also known as diversifying selection. So here is where you have that intermediate group and all of a sudden um, it's good to be one of the extremes, but it's bad to be the intermediate. Again, the, the three drawings I think at the beginning should, should um, help explain this stuff. So both phenotypic extremes are favored. In environments that have lots of uh, variation, this is going to be um, fairly common. Um, so let's say that there's some um, dark areas on the ground and some light areas on the ground, but for whatever reason, there's no medium shaded areas on the ground. That would lead to disruptive selection or diversifying selection. Um, and actually that, that um, pocket mouse video actually gives a better example of diversifying a selection. So um, for our last content, I think this stuff's pretty straightforward. Um, again, if you can read these three graphs and make sense of it, um, I know it seems silly, but follow along with these um, hand gestures and it'll, uh, hi there. She's being ignored. Hi there. Sorry, I know some of you guys uh, like babies and think they're very cute. And some of you like, if I was in high school, I'd be bored with looking at uh, my teacher's daughter. Anyways, um, hand gestures. Think about that original population. Stabilizing selection. You squeeze towards the middle. Um, directional selection, you shift to one side, and then diversifying selection, that's where you exclude the middle and push to the extremes. So if you can look at these three diagrams, um, and based on a, a stable environment, you might get stabilized in selection. Um, based on a new environment, directional selection, and then in certain cases when as I mentioned, the phenotypic extreme is um, selected upon, you're gonna get disruptive, where it's good to be um, one of the two extremes, but bad to be uh, one in the middle. Uh, you don't need to know this for notes, but this is just too interesting not to share. There's an extreme example um, just discovered known as tri-diversifying selection. So obviously this is no longer on that, um, uh, two-dimensional chart scale. There's, there's three outcomes here. Um, it's also known as the rock, paper, scissors hypothesis of evolution. Here's where a, um, a type of male lizard um, 
comes in three very distinct sizes and colors. And believe it or not, all three are beneficial to survival because they outcompete another one. Um, the orange is the obvious winner. The, um, the orange lizard is the largest one. So that's kind of like the rock in rock, paper, scissors where it can smash the scissors. So the orange lizard outcompetes the blue lizard, which is the medium size for a mate. Um, now the blue lizard outcompetes the yellow lizard for a mate because the yellow lizard is really, really small. Um, and so you're probably thinking, how does the yellow lizard outcompete the orange? The yellow lizard is so small, it looks just like the female lizard of this species. And I can't remember the name of the species. You can look it up if you look up that uh, hypothesis. But the yellow male lizard um, tricks the orange male lizard into thinking it's a female. So the orange male lizard tries to mate with the yellow male lizard. When the orange lizard is then exhausted, the yellow lizard will mate with the female and it basically outsmarts the uh, orange. So orange beats blue, blue beats yellow, and strangely enough, yellow beats orange. So again, this is called tri-diversifying selection. Uh, pretty interesting. And as I mentioned, um, rock pocket mice um, is uh, actually an example of uh, diversifying selection as well. And you'll see based on the environment that they live in, um, hi there, the, based on the environment that they live in, they're going to come in um, two more extreme phenotypes, but less in the um, moderate phenotype. Um, last but not least, and you're not going to actually see this on the quiz, um, but again, this is something that I find fairly interesting, um, artificial selection, when humans cause selection. So a great example of this, turning the gray wolf into all the different breeds of dogs that we have today. Um, humans have really been practicing, you know, perfecting evolution for thousands of years since the beginning of agriculture. So we can take a species like the wolf that has some tendencies such as being friendly towards human, and we can keep... Um, uh, finding those tendencies or creating those tendencies to go towards the extreme. So you find two wolves that happen to be more friendly to humans than the average wolf. You breed them together. You're going to get an offspring that's even more friendly Then a couple more generations. You find those wolves that are the friendliest, the least aggressive, the least uh, dominant. You breed them together and you go down generations and eventually you get uh, the dog, something that's really, really friendly and has no, you know, natural, um, uh, aggression towards human. And so again, looking at these different species of dogs, you can get really, really unique traits by um, going towards the extremes. Um, believe it or not, uh, pigeons are uh, fairly coveted in certain cultures um, based on their really unique um, traits. And so you see these really odd looking pigeons, like look here in the middle, the Saxon fairy swallow. Um, and look at those crazy feet. It has feathers on its feet that look like giant mops. Um, take a minute here and try to actually explain to yourself, or if you have a brother or sister, grab them. Explain how do you take a regular pigeon and over 100 generations turn it into the Saxon fairy swallow. So pause the video, think about how you could actually do that. So you would find a, a pigeon that had maybe an extra long feather or two down by its feet, or find a pigeon where its feathers go closer to its feet than the average pigeon. Um, and uh, you find two pigeons like that, you breed them together. Um, maybe they have 20 babies. And of those 20 babies, um, you basically find the ones that have even longer feathers down by their feet. Um, you breed those, um, which would be inbreeding. Oftentimes when, when we're finding really unique examples like this, um, inbreeding does occur. And so you keep going down the line and you find the pigeon that has the, um, the, the longest feathers down by its feet, you breed them together, um, and you keep getting this further and further variation from the norm. And then eventually you end up with this breed of pigeon. Um, another great example is agriculture. So you see on the left here an example of a wild strawberry um, and then over generations of breeding the largest and the sweetest and the uh, easiest to grow strawberries, we get the type that we see 
today in the farmer's market. Um, modern corn uh, does not exist in the wild. It comes from a natural grain known as teosinte that grew in Mexico. Um, and we see that over um, lots and lots of generations, they took the female version of teosinte and bred it to have um, the largest and sweetest and most nutritious kernels. That's what we get today, modern corn. Um, Kale, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and kohlrabi are all the exact same wild plant. They all come from a uh, brassica uh, family known as wild mustard. And basically you can breed it to have um, a really big root like this, or um, a really large center flower like that, or really big and tasty leaves like that. And so you can actually get all these different, um, all these different crops are actually developed from the same natural plant through artificial selection. Uh, chickens, again, not a wild species, but they originated from Asian jungle fowl. Um, they were bred over time to have, uh, to lay more eggs, to um, be able to survive and, and live in close quarters to one another. Um, to have larger um, muscles and, ha and have more meat uh, for consumption. The dairy cow uh, comes from a water buffalo. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to, to give you guys a little bit about artificial selection because uh, I think it is an interesting topic even though it doesn't come up like in our, our quiz or anything. Um, so anyways, that is it for uh, content for the year. Um, remember, looking ahead, we have um, our uh evolution packet is due tonight uh so i'll, I'll put a um post on edmodo that that last page is on the three types of selection those three outcomes of evolution uh and then upload and turn in that entire packet um you know if it's a day or two late that's okay but try to get it in by the end of this week uh if possible so that would be uh this friday the 29th um but better yet just get it in tonight the 26th um so that's it for today. Um, hope you guys have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on Thursday. Okay, now it is Thursday, the 28th. Um, we will look ahead one more time just to make sure you guys are all on the same page about what's going on in the next few weeks. Um, today's assignment is pretty straightforward. It's a study guide. Um, as you guys know, the study guides are not... Um, a direct grade, but I would argue that they are indirectly um, a big part of your grade because they indirectly um, lead to you doing better on the, the quizzes and tests. Um, there is a Kahoot today at 3 p.m., so I hope to see as many of you there uh, as possible. And then on Tuesday, we'll have our evolution quiz. Um, looking over the next couple weeks, as I mentioned today, study guide and a Kahoot at 3 p.m. Um, quiz is on Tuesday and then um, I'll be available on June 4th for any last questions about that final project. Uh, normal time, three o'clock on Thursday. And then your final projects, uh, Evolve and Animal, are due um, on the 9th for 1B and 2B and on the 11th for 3B, 4B. Um, and that is